want to welcome our Calvary family watching this service this morning online and any guests that are joining with us today. As you can tell, as you can see through the cameras, uh, we have an empty sanctuary today. We are on a skeleton crew. Uh, that's because we had a positive COVID case uh, diagnosed on Thursday. Been in a contact with the Scary County Health Department and they said there's no risk at all to anybody from our congregation. This person was in service last Sunday, but because it was over 48 hours from the time they were in service to the time their symptoms began, uh, there's no issue for the congregation. Nonetheless, we wanted to err on the side of caution, the Board of Elders and I. Uh, we're in the midst of a second wave that has begun. Uh, I know that in speaking with the health department, they said normally they get four to six cases a week, and they're getting that many in a day. They have over 200 people in quarantine. And so rather than run the risk of spreading it, uh, we decided let's just go virtual this week. We're the fourth church so far in the county that I'm aware of uh, that has a COVID case. Two of the churches uh, went virtual or are virtual. The fourth church will be deciding this week. So we just thought it would be wise. We have a responsibility to protect the flock. We also want to be good stewards and good neighbors. And so that's why we're doing the service. I don't have the worship team with me, again, to limit the contact. So this may be one of the shortest services, um, but that doesn't mean God's presence isn't here. Although we're distanced from each other, and I don't have a congregation to preach to. And I got to tell you, it's, it's weird again. I had gotten used to having everybody here. Um, it's been months since we've had to do something like this. But uh, if you remember from your history, the pandemic and the 100 years ago, it wasn't the first wave, it was the second wave that caused most of the problem. We are thankful, though, that what we're hearing from the health department is that so far cases have been mild, uh, just a few hospitalizations, no, no further deaths, so we're thankful for that. But we know we're going to make it through because God is carrying us through. The Lord is our shepherd. And I want to use that as a call to worship this morning from Psalm 23. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not be in want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside quiet waters. He restores my soul. He guides me in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup overflows. Surely goodness and love or mercy will follow me all the days of my life. And I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. What assurance that we have as the body of Christ. That the Lord is our shepherd now. That the Lord will carry us through now. And that when all is said and done, we will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. So be encouraged, Calvary family. I'm going to open our service here in prayer, but I do want to let you know that I have my cell phone with me, and although we are distanced from each other, I still want to be able to take prayer requests from you. Uh, I'm just checking. I'm already getting calls coming in. Um, yes, Diane, the service has already started at 10 a.m. You can hopefully, uh, let me just say, let her know what time it is here. So just give me a moment. Let me just quickly put to 10. And there we go. And so if you have a prayer request, I want us to stay connected. And if you have a prayer request, then we're going to be able to pray together for that need. If you have a praise report, I want to be able to share that so we can rejoice together. The Bible says that we weep with those who weep and we rejoice with those who rejoice. And also, as I preach the message that God put on my heart in our faith, our we're sharing series, if there's a point that stands out to you, something like, wow, that, that really meant something to me, go ahead and let me know that as well. And that way we'll be able to reference that when the message is over. So let's look to the Lord in prayer. Oh Lord, I thank you. Although this is certainly not an ideal situation in that we cannot be together in person, I thank you that we are united in the Holy Spirit and that we're not separated spiritually, that we're still connected in the body of Christ. Lord, none of us would like to be where we are today. We would like this scourge to come to an end and for life to go back where we can get together and hug and, and, and uh, talk.
talk together without masks. But for the time being, this is the, the life that we have, and we pray that we could respond uh, as Christians who are full of the joy of the Lord. If the Apostle Paul could tell us 17 times in four chapters in Philippians, in the midst of house arrest, to be filled with joy, then certainly we can be filled with joy today. And I thank you for the message that you have for us today. I thank you for the anointing of your Holy Spirit that will open the word of God to us so that we could better understand your word. And we bless and praise you for what you're going to do here today. In Jesus' name, amen. Um, if you have your Bibles, I'm going to ask if you would turn to the book of Acts, chapter 16. Acts, chapter 16. When I sent out the email to everybody, I said if you wanted to prep for the message, if you read through Acts chapter 16, 17, 18, and 19, it would provide you a good foundation for uh, what we're doing. So, um, okay, I'm just getting word. I'm just letting Mike know up there in the studio. Uh, Diane said that she's not getting anything yet uh, on the YouTube channel. Um, it should be Calvary, uh, Cobleskill Calvary Assembly, and hopefully that will be able to work. But uh, we're in Acts 16, and you may have noticed um, that throughout this series of faith we're sharing, we keep coming back to the book of Acts. And even when we start, as we did last week in the book of Luke, we still end up in the book of Acts. And the reason we're in the book of Acts is that in this book, we get a historical record of how the early church took seriously the mission of the church to go and make disciples. We get the opportunity to see how the church brought the message, the gospel of the kingdom, to Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, all the way to Rome. We get a chance in the book of Acts to see how they followed that method Jesus gave them of the whole gospel to the whole person, to the mind, to the heart, and to the will. And we also see how they did it through the power and presence of the Holy Spirit. In other words, in our series so far, what we're seeing is how the mission, the message, the method, and the means, the first four points of our series so far, are lived out in real time. And in so doing, we get an opportunity to uh, get an example, a model for us, so that we, 20 centuries later, can do the same thing. We can fulfill the same mission to go and make disciples. We can bring the same message, the gospel of the kingdom. We can follow the same method of the whole gospel to the whole person. And we can do it through the same means, through the power and presence of the Holy Spirit. Today in Acts 16, we're going to find a fifth characteristic that is foundational to a faith worth sharing. And so I want to read verses 6 through 10 with you this morning. Paul and his companions traveled throughout the region of Phrygia and Galatia, having been kept by the Holy Spirit from preaching the word in the province of Asia. When they came to the border of Mycenae, they tried to enter Bithynia, but the Spirit of Jesus would not allow them to. So they passed by Mycenae and went down to Troas. During the night, Paul had a vision of a man of Macedonia standing and begging him, Come over to Macedonia and help us. After Paul had seen the vision, we got ready at once to leave for Macedonia, concluding that God had called us to preach the gospel to them. May the Lord add his favor and blessing upon the word of God. Probably you're familiar with the term, timing is everything. Being at the right place and at the right time can make all the difference in the world. Timing is everything. Now, if you're a sports fan, and I know many of you are because I see your posts on Facebook when your team wins, and I see your posts on Facebook when your team loses. So I know I've got some sports fans, not in the sanctuary, but at least watching the broadcast this morning. Timing is everything. In 2019, in the NBA playoffs, uh, pre-COVID, of course, uh, I had a chance to watch uh, on TV Kawhi Leonard, who I have followed since he played with the San Antonio Spurs. He was with the Toronto Raptors. And they're in the seventh game of the Eastern Conference Finals playing Philadelphia. Uh, they're down, uh, losing, and Kawhi gets the ball, 
and lets off. He, he gets it at the top of the key. He makes his way all the way around, almost three quarters around, and he makes his shot, and he knows he has to go high with it. 4.2 seconds left to go in the game. So he's got the ball. He shoots it up over the defender. It goes up. It hits the rim and then bounces up, and as it hits the rim, bounces up, it reverses in terms of the spin, comes back down, hits the rim again, goes back up, comes down, hits the other side of the rim, goes back up again, hits the rim again, and falls through the hole. And the Raptors ended up winning that game in the last 4.2 seconds of the game, and they ended up going on to win the championship. Kawhi was in the right place at the right time and took the winning shot. Now, some of you are old enough to remember the Pittsburgh Steelers' Steel Curtain and Terry Bradshaw. This goes all the way back into the 70s. And there's one play that's called the Immaculate Reception. Uh, the game was down in the last 30 seconds. It was a divisional playoff game in the AFC. And uh, Terry Bradshaw goes back. He passes the ball. And they're not sure if it bounced off the helmet of the defender, uh, bounced out of the hands of the receiver, but nonetheless, the ball didn't land there. It started falling, and Franco Harris, the rusher for the, Brad, uh, for the Steelers, got the ball just before it hit the ground, scooped it up, and ran it in in the last 30 seconds of the game. And Pittsburgh ended up winning the game. And you can see on the uh, television screen there a picture of a uh, statue there of uh, Franco Harris in the scoop. There was some controversy over the play. Some thought it hit the ground first, and whatever, but it still stands in history. Franco was in the right place at the right time. Solomon speaks of the right time for certain things in Ecclesiastes 3. He says this, there is a time for everything and a season for every activity under heaven. Timing is everything, Solomon could say. There's a right time and a right place. He said there's a time to be born and a time to die, a time to plant and a time to uproot, a time to kill, a time to heal, a time to tear down and a time to build, a time to weep and a time to laugh, a time to mourn and a time to dance, a time to scatter stones and a time to gather them, a time to embrace and a time to refrain, a time to search and a time to give up, a time to keep and a time to throw away, a time to tear and a time to mend, a time to be silent, and a time to speak. Let me say that again. A time to be silent and a time to speak. A time to love and a time to hate. A time for war and a time for peace. Timing is everything. Now next month we're going to celebrate the uh, birth of Jesus Christ. And sometime during the course of the month, I'm sure I'm going to reference a passage of scripture in Galatians chapter, chapter 4, verses 4 and 5. It says this, When the time had fully come, God sent his Son, born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem those under law, that we might receive the full rights of sons. For when the time had fully come, I believe the King James says, but in the fullness of time. Another translation says, at just the right time, God sent forth his Son. When you take a look at the Old Testament prophecies, and there are a number of them that talked about the coming of the Messiah, and you take the timing that Daniel has down to the year, and then you look at the Greco-Roman world with the Greek language spread throughout the Roman Empire, and the Roman world with its roads and its Pax Romana or Roman peace, it was just the right time for Jesus to come. Now the reason I take all this time to talk about timing is everything, it's also true it appears, based on our text, that timing is everything when it comes to sharing our faith. Solomon said there's a time to be silent and a time to speak. And it's also true when we share our faith. There is a time when God has opened the doors for us to speak, and there's times when those doors are shut. Now, I shared a condensed version of this message two months ago with our Board of Elders, and it was talking about open doors, just a brief devotion. And since then, I took it and I reworked it and I enlarged it because I believe it's a message that the entire congregation needs to hear and it connects to this series about a faith worth sharing. So taking a look at Acts 16, let me give you the context here. Paul is in the midst of his second missionary journey. 
Now, up to this point, Paul has been very successful in ministry. God had opened doors for him to minister when he first got saved in Damascus. He uh, had an opportunity when Barnabas sought him out to come and be one of the teachers in Antioch, uh, where Christians, where believers were first called Christian, and he had valuable ministry there, training and discipling and equipping saints. And then when God called him and Barnabas to go on the first missionary trip, they traveled to Galatia and they planted churches all over Galatia. And we read about this in the book of Acts. Again, very, very fruitful ministry. Um, now that didn't mean he didn't face some opposition. I mean, he got driven out of town a few times and they tried to stone him to death. But he still had open doors of ministry. He still had opportunities to see fruit. And in fact, in Acts 15, when the Jerusalem Council was held, he and Barnabas shared so many stories of God reaching down and saving people and confirming the word with signs and wonders following. So Paul's on his second missionary journey, and he's expecting, boy, we're going to have great ministry again, just like we did last time. I can't, I can't wait to see what God's going to do. And so this time, not Barnabas, but Silas traveled with him, and he made his way uh, through those cities of Galatia. He picked up Timothy, and everything's going well. And then all of a sudden, bang, he runs into a closed door. Everything shuts down. Take a look, Acts 16. And notice, the closed door wasn't from opposition. The closed door wasn't because people wouldn't let him come into their town. Take a look at Acts 16. Paul and his companions travel throughout the region of Phrygia and Galatia. Okay, everything's good there. Having been kept by the Holy Spirit from preaching the word in the province of Asia. The Holy Spirit stopped them from fulfilling the mission. They keep going on here. When they came to the border of Mycenae, they tried to enter Bithynia. But the Spirit of Jesus would not allow them to. Now what is going on? The Holy Spirit wouldn't let them preach the gospel? What's the deal? The disciples were given a mission. Paul was given the commission to go and preach the gospel. Why on earth would the Holy Spirit say, no, doors closed? Why would the Holy Spirit shut the door in such a way that Paul couldn't get through? We really don't know. We, we, could, we could make some guesses. Uh, you know, maybe there were some other things that God wanted to do instead. Maybe the fields weren't ready. I mean, it certainly wasn't because the province of Asia was uninhabited. I mean, you had cities all over the place. You had uh, Ephesus and Smyrna. You had um, Pergamum and Thyatira. You had Sardis. You had Philadelphia, Laodicea, Hierapolis. You had Colossae. I mean, you had multiple uh, cities with people in them. So it's not because it was uninhabited. And it certainly wasn't because they were all Christian already and didn't need Jesus. I mean, they had pagan temples in these cities. Ephesus, for example, had the temple to Diana, or in Greek, the Artem uh, temple to Artemis. There was a meteorite that had come to earth, and they took it as the god coming to earth, and so they built this temple for her. It was one of the, I think, seven wonders uh, of the ancient world. People came from everywhere to this temple. I mean, they set up souvenir shops because they wanted to make money off of it. And so there were definitely pagans there that needed Jesus. Well, maybe the Lord just didn't want those people saved. You know, don't go there. I don't want them saved. Of course, that's not the case. The Bible says God is not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to a knowledge of the truth. So why on earth would the Holy Spirit say, no, don't fulfill the mission, don't preach the gospel, don't bring the whole gospel to the whole person, don't, the Holy Spirit's not going to empower you, don't go there. Why? We just don't know. We just don't know. But what we do know is the Holy Spirit closed the door. Now, how did Paul respond? The way we often respond when God closes the door is we start pouting. We start whining. We start whimpering. We start complaining. Not Paul. Paul didn't just sit there. He said, let's just keep going. Take a look in verse 8 of our text. So they passed by Mycenae. 
If God closed that door, we're not going to try to push it open. And that brings us to the first application point of today's message. Don't force a door, don't, don't force open a door the Holy Spirit is closed. Don't force open a door the Holy Spirit is closed. It's a little picture there of a burglar trying to break in. If God shut the door, you may not know the reason for it. But if he shut the door, he's got a reason for it. And we just have to trust him. Now how does that apply to this faith we're sharing series? Well, through my years, I have known people, and I was one of them, who in the midst of zeal just wanted to get everybody saved. I used to go to, uh, and I've shared this before, but I used to go to rock concerts standing outside the auditorium with a nine foot by seven foot cross with a bunch of friends of mine, and people were coming out of the concert. One concert was Styx. Styx is the river to hell. And so we were screaming at people coming out, Styx is the river to hell, but Jesus is the river of life. You know, I don't know how effective we were. Personally, I didn't think that much. They were spitting on us, and I just don't think that's the most effective way to reach somebody. Um, but I was trying to, to force the door open. I was trying to make it happen. We went to, to carnivals carrying this nine foot by seven foot cross. I think we were a carnival with what we were doing, but we were zealous. And some people with zeal and some people out of guilt or fear try to force a door open when the Lord hasn't opened the door. Years ago, we had a, a guest come in. He was an evangelist, and we had him come in because his goal was to help you reach your community for Christ, which is a laudable goal. It's fulfilling the mission. And so we had him come in. And uh, he trained us, and, uh, and the way he did it, his method was, is he had a survey. And he had us go house to house, and some of you actually may remember this, and we would ask survey questions of the people. Uh, you know, questions, do you go to church? Uh, and if you do go to church, which one? Um, do you feel that the church as a whole is meeting your needs? What needs do you have that aren't being met? And it was just basically supposed to be, at least initially, a survey to gauge the interest in the community and help meet the needs spiritually. But it was a bait and switch survey because when you got to the end, you were supposed to kind of cram the word of God in them and get them saved. Now, after the campaign was over and I was driving them back, I think it was to the airport, I said, look, I got a problem with what you just did. Uh, I said, I'm, I'm all for reaching people for Christ. I said, but you did a bait and switch. And his words to me were, it doesn't matter. We're just getting the word out, and the word of God will not return void. So maybe we connected with one or two, but how many did we turn off to the gospel? There is a time to speak, and there is a time to be silent. Timing is everything. And if the conversion experience is the work of the Holy Spirit, then ought we not to go where the door is open from the Spirit and not go where the door is closed? Not trying to force the issue, not trying to force the door open, but instead move with the Spirit. And so the first point is don't force the door open that the Holy Spirit is closed. What are we supposed to do instead? Well, what did Paul do? Paul didn't just sit around and whine and whimper. Paul didn't just sit there, fine, I'm going to wait here at the doorstop to Asia until the Holy Spirit opens that door. I'm not moving. No, look what Paul did in verse 8. So they passed by Mycia and went down to Troas. They stayed on the road that they were traveling on. All right, if God's going to close this door off, we'll just keep going on the way we're going. So they made it to Troas, and if I remember my geography, I believe that's on the Adriatic, uh, on the uh, eastern Adriatic, and they're there, and during the night, Paul has a vision of a man in Macedonia standing and begging him, come over to Macedonia and help us. My kids used to watch this cartoon show called Phineas and Ferb. It was about this uh, two brothers that had the summer, and they were trying to decide what they're going to do every day. And Phineas would always look over at Ferb and say, Hey, Ferb, I know what we're going to do today. I can almost imagine the Apostle Paul looking to Luke, who he met in Troas, and Silas, who was with him, and Timothy. Hey, guys, I know what we're going to do today. We're going to Macedonia. And when you look at all of the fruit that God brought to 
Paul and Silas and Luke and Timothy as a result of their not trying to force open the door that the Spirit closed, but walking through a door that God opened, you'd be shocked. For example, he met Luke in Troas. Luke, the beloved physician, became a close companion of Paul's throughout his entire ministry, was with him most of the time, and given how many times Paul got beaten, and Paul suffered, it was great that he had a traveling physician with him. We also know that on that second missionary journey, Paul made it over to Thessalonica and planted a church there. He made it to Philippi and met Lydia, a seller of purple, who became part of that infant church in Philippi. We know that Paul and Silas had the opportunity, because they were put in jail in Philippi, to witness to the jailer and his family, and they came to faith in Christ. Paul was able to cast out a demon in a demon-possessed girl who was given the fortune-telling, and she became part of the church. And that church in Philippi became one of the most giving churches that Paul had. In fact, because Paul was obedient to that second missionary journey, we have the book of Philippians in our Bible. And they continually gave him support so that he was able to devote himself full-time to ministry again and again. And we get First and Second Thessalonians because he went on that second missionary journey. Not only that, on that second missionary journey, the Apostle Paul was able to make it to Athens. And we have Acts 17 where he was able to preach the gospel to the Areopagus. And then he also made it to Corinth in Acts chapter 18. And because of that, he was there 18 months, got a church planted there. And because of that, we have First and Second Corinthians. So five books of the Bible are there because Paul didn't try to force open a door that was closed. Instead, he looked for the door God had opened. See, if God closes a door one place, it's because he's going to open the door somewhere else. So instead of being frustrated over what you don't have, be open to what God wants to give. Instead of being frustrated that this door won't open for you, look for the door the Lord has opened. Look for the open door door. Now when I uh, look at my own life and I, I think of some examples where this happened, uh, on my 30th class reunion I had a chance to, to attend high school. I had never gone to one of those. But one of the things you realize about open doors is they often come at transition points in people's lives. It could be at a time when they get married or a time when they have children or a time when they're empty nesters, or a time when they've had a loss, or a time when they've moved into retirement. What happens is, is that in those transition periods of people's lives, they're more open than they otherwise would be. And so when we build relationships with people, not just to get a notch on our belt and get them saved, but to actually, because we care about people, and I'll speak more about this later on in another message, but when we build relationships with people, we get a chance to see where they're at in their life. We get a chance to walk with them through transition points, and we'll find that doors open. Now, I saw this happen on my 30th class reunion. As I said, I had never attended one of my reunions before, but I just felt from the Lord that I was supposed to go to this one. And so I signed up to go, and I ended up getting an email from one of the committee members who happened to be a gentleman that I had shared the faith with when I was in high school. Um, I had the nickname The Reverend when I was in high school. I had a chance to speak at my baccalaureate, and so they knew that I was a pastor, and that <laughs> this gentleman who was helping chair the committee, he said, would you be willing to share a few words and pray for our class? Let me pray about it. No, it was an open door. Hey, Ferb, I know what we're going to do today. And so I was excited about the opportunity to go. My wife and I went. They had a, a beautiful, I think it was a luncheon or a dinner cruise that we went on. And then they also had this picnic at Webster Park. And so we got there, and where the Lord led me was to talk about the brevity of life. And the reason I did that is even though our class was only 30 years old, which put us in our late 40s at the time, we had lost a number of our classmates. Many of them had died with cancer. Some had died in accidents. And so I was sharing with them that, you know, when you're 18, you think you got your whole life ahead of you, and yet here we've lost classmates. And I, and I shared about how important it is to live life in a way that counts, so that when we get to the end of the life, there's no regrets. And I was able to share the gospel of Jesus Christ and pray. In fact, the committee member who 
emailed me. He said, please do not hesitate to mention the name of Jesus. We're good with it. That's an open door. And so I was able to preach the gospel, and I thought, this is great. This is why I'm here. And then as we're getting ready to wrap up, they, uh, they were told about the fact that that night they were going to go to the sports bar in Webster, the Corvary Recovery Sports Bar. Now, because my dad was an alcoholic, I tend to stay away from bars. But for some reason, I felt the Holy Spirit was saying, you need to be there. So I asked my wife, and she said, go, just go. And so I went that night, and as I'm kind of mingling around and chatting, and somebody came up to me who was there that afternoon at the picnic and said, I can't stop thinking about what you said today. That really gave me a lot to ponder. And I found myself at the recovery bar actually doing counseling and ministry because people wanted to talk about it. See, God gave the open door, and because of that open door, I was able to do ministry afterwards. And when I was just about ready to leave, one of the young ladies who had attended the church that I attended when I was a teenager came up to me. And she said this, and it, it just it so moved my heart. She goes, you were exactly what I expected Jesus would have been if you were here. Open door. Every day, God gives us open doors. Every day, God opens up opportunities for us to bear witness to Jesus Christ. The goal is, is to be sensitive to the Holy Spirit, to be responsive and, and be led by the Holy Spirit to those open doors. It may be a hug, it may be a word, it may be a deed. That's up to God to do. But be open because he's preparing hearts. Why? Because he wants this mission fulfilled to go and make disciples of all nations. God wants to give everybody an opportunity to hear the good news of Jesus Christ. He doesn't want anyone to miss the gospel of the kingdom. The whole gospel to the whole person through the power and presence of the Spirit. We just need to be looking for those open doors. So we don't force the door open that the Holy Spirit closed, but we do look for open doors. Well, what if? What if we look around and we don't see an open door? Then what do we do? Do we just say, oh, I guess I don't do anything? No, we do what the Apostle Paul did. We're going to step out of Acts 16 and we're going to Shift over to Colossians 4, but look what the Apostle Paul says. He says, pray for us too, that God may open a door for our message. Oh, did you hear that? Pray for us that God may open a door for our message, so that we may proclaim the mystery of Christ, for which I'm in chains. Pray that I may proclaim it clearly as I should. Not every door that's closed has been closed by God. Sometimes it's the enemy that's trying to shut the door. Or put it this way, sometimes it's the enemy that's trying to hold the door shut so that it doesn't open, so that the gospel can't go forth. Why? Because the devil knows that if the gospel goes forth inspired by the Holy Spirit, the gospel of the kingdom, by somebody who wants to fulfill the mission and they're bringing the whole gospel to the whole person, he is going to lose people from his kingdom, and they're going to be transferred to the kingdom of God's dear son. They're going to leave the kingdom of darkness and come into the kingdom of light. And so he will do everything he can to prevent people. And we know this because of a verse that I read last week, 2 Corinthians 4.4. 4. The God of this age has blinded the minds of unbelievers, so they cannot see the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. This is not the Holy Spirit saying, no, this is the devil blocking them so they can't see. They cannot see. So how do we, how do we address this? What do we do with this? The devil is trying to blind people so they can't see the gospel. What we're going to do, though, is through the power and presence of the Spirit, is pray open that door because if we submit ourselves to God and resist the devil, he flees. And you can see how this occurred in real time in Acts 13 when Paul had to confront somebody that was trying to block the door. Take a look. Verse 6. They, that is Paul and Barnabas, traveled throughout the whole island until they came to Paphos. They're on the island of Cyprus, by the way. It says, there they met a Jewish sorcerer and false prophet named Bargesus, who was an attendant of the proconsul Sergius Paulus. The proconsul, an intelligent man 
sent for Barnabas and Saul because he wanted to hear the word of God. Notice, here was an open door. He wants to hear the gospel. The door is open. But look what Satan tries to do through Elymas the sorcerer, for that's what his name means. He opposed them and tried to turn the proconsul from the faith. Elymas trying to whisper in his ear. It's sort of like Lord of the Rings when Wormtongue tried to shut the voice up and not let King Theoden hear the word from Gandalf. And so here you have Elymas trying to oppose Paul and Barnabas. They're trying to shut the door. They're trying to close the door. This Elymas is trying to close the door. But then Saul, who was also called Paul, I love it, filled with the Holy Spirit, looked straight at Elymas and said, you are a child of the devil and an enemy of everything that is right. You are full of all kinds of deceit and trickery. Will you never stop perverting the right ways of the Lord? Now the hand of the Lord is against you. You are going to be blind, and for a time you will be unable to see the light of the sun. Immediately mist and darkness came over him, and he groped about seeking someone to lead him by the hand. When the proconsul saw what had happened, he believed, for he was amazed at the teaching about the Lord. See, Paul was filled with the Spirit. Paul had been praying. Paul and Barnabas were ready. They were, they were, they had, remember when they started their, their journey back in Acts 13, chapter we're in, earlier in the chapter, they had been fasting and praying. And then the Holy Spirit sent them out. So they were prayed up, they were filled up, they were ready to go, and they were praying for God to open doors. And so here we get to this first occasion in Cyprus. They're doing ministry, the door starts to try to close, like uh, 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 and in the power of the Spirit, Paul calls down upon this individual, God's judgment, and the proconsul came to faith in Christ. This is a power encounter through the power and presence of the Spirit. There are times when you and I will share the faith with somebody and, and you know that the Spirit of the Lord is there and the door is open. And all of a sudden you'll watch as if a glaze comes upon their eyes. In that moment, don't argue stronger, pray harder. Because the enemy wants to shut the door. The enemy wants to close it off. Jesus talked about the parable of the sower where the, the, the uh, enemy is like the birds of the air that come and take away the seed. No, don't you give up. Paul didn't say, oh well. Oh, I guess there's nothing I can do. No, Paul, filled with the Spirit, says, not on my watch, not on my watch. And so when we are, are confronting the enemy like this, and the enemy tries to come in and hinder, you don't give up praying. You just go to the Spirit, and you start praying in the Spirit for God to rule. You don't have to scare the person. And God, I said, no, just let the Spirit lead you. And you pray inside and let the Spirit guide you, and watch that door reopen. Because Satan wants to close the doors. We know in 1 Thessalonians 2, here's another example. On his second missionary journey, Paul had preached in Thessalonica, but was driven out of town. He tried to get back. Look what it says. But brothers, when we were torn away from you for a short time, in person, not in thought, out of our intense longing, we made every effort to see you. For we wanted to come to you. Certainly, I, Paul, did again and again. But Satan stopped us. There was a hindrance. Now, Paul didn't say, I guess there's nothing I can do. The devil's so strong. No, Paul prayed. And on his third missionary journey, when Paul came back to that area, guess what happened? Thessalonica opened up again. Because Paul prayed and the enemy could not hold on. Often what happens is we engage the... i got to stay behind the pulpit because the cameras aren't moving. Sorry about that up there, Mike. You can't ask me just to be still. That is tough. I'm just telling you. Um, so, oh, I was, okay. So, um, I just lost my train of thought. So, Paul's preaching. There we go. So, Paul made it back to Thessalonica. Paul was able to get in there because he prayed through. And the enemy can only hinder so long. The problem is, is that the enemy wants to hinder, and the saint's praying, and it's who's going to quit first. There's a saying in car sales that after the deal's on the table, the first person to talk loses. Well, in this case, is whoever gives up first. And many a saint has given up victory just a step before the enemy was ready to give up. 
No, you submit yourself to God, you resist the devil, and he flees. He is a defeated foe through Jesus Christ. And so what we do here, this is application number three, is when the, the, the door doesn't seem to be open, when the enemy seems to be trying to hold that door uh, closed, you pray. You pray for the open door. You, you, you stay in prayer until the door opens. You believe God to open that door. Why? Because here's what Paul says in Revel or excuse me, what Jesus says in Revelation 3:8. He's speaking to the church of Philadelphia. I know your deeds. See, I have placed before you an open door that no one can shut. I know that you have little strength, that you have kept my word and have not denied my name. The Philadelphia church was a good church. It was a church that never got rebuked. But notice what God says. The Lord says to this church, I have placed before you an open door that no one can shut. See, the enemy may try, but he cannot stop the saint of God on their knees, filled with the Spirit, who prays open that door. And so I want to encourage you to begin praying for open doors. Don't just, you know, uh, look for the open door. Pray for the open door. I'll give you a personal testimony. As many of you know, I've been a substitute teacher in the Cobble Scale school system now. April will mark 20 years that I've been teaching. And I enjoy, I enjoy doing that. Um, but I also recognize that it's an opportunity for me to bear witness to Christ. Not in a proselytizing way, that's not something that's permitted, but just being a carrier of the presence of Jesus. And so knowing that, when I go to the school, I, I pray. I said, Lord, would you open doors today so that I can share your love just by who I am in Christ? And if you give me an open door to share something, you know, they ask me a question or raise an issue that I'll be able to, to come. Now, the opportunities have been multiple. Let me just share a few of them with you. Uh, one year, I was asked to go into the English class uh, in high school. And guess what unit they were covering that day that I was supposed to teach? They were covering Puritan sermons. Jonathan Edwards, sinners in the hands of an angry God. We had a great class, let me just tell you that. And then another time, uh, I went in, and, uh, and this time it was, uh, it was um, well, a couple other times. But, but this particular time I went in, I had been asked to, as part of a career day, they asked people in the community to come and share what they do in their careers. And I got asked to come in and talk about what it means to be a pastor. <laughs> I was invited in to talk about what does it mean to be a pastor. I got a chance to share what I do in the gospel of Jesus Christ. Then one time I got called into social studies and the unit they were talking about just happened to be church history and the ecumenical councils of the first few hundred years of the church's history. And I got a chance to talk about God, who he is, because it was in the lesson. And one last example. When, when you pray open the doors, I had prayed that particular day, and I was in for uh, one of the classes, and I was sitting in one of my, it was a lunch break, so it was one of my periods that were off. And I'm just sitting there, and often is the case, because I've, I've subbed so often, the kids know me, they'll come in during my off period and just sit there, and they'll start yapping among themselves. Well, this particular day, there were three or four kids that were there, and, uh, and one of them just out of the blue, I'm just sitting there eating or doing something. All of a sudden, out of the blue, I hear this question. Do you believe in God? Well, that piqued my interest. I looked up, and one of the kids said, yeah, yeah, I do. So I said, yeah, I do. And they looked at me. You do? I said, yeah. I said, my regular job, I'm a pastor. Man, it was like throwing steak to dogs. They're like, you're a pastor. Can we ask you Bible questions? Sure, it's a free period. And for the next 40 minutes, they asked me questions from the Bible that they had always wanted answered. They wanted to know about uh, the Tower of Babel. They wanted to know about Noah's Ark. They wanted to know about Adam and Eve. And so I had a chance to simply give them information because they were just, and when it was all done, this open door, when it was all done, they said, can we do this again? And I said, absolutely. See, sometimes the doors aren't open and you have to pray for them open. You have to ask the Lord to open the door for you. So. So far, we've took the, looked at the fact that you don't force the door open, the Holy Spirit is closed. Leave it closed. That's his business, leave it closed. Secondly, you look for the open door, see if there's already one open. And if it is, walk through it. And if there isn't an open door, pray. 
pray that God would open the door for you so you would have an opportunity to fulfill the Great Commission, that you can be on point with the mission, bringing the message, the gospel of the kingdom, the whole gospel, the whole person, his method, through the power and presence of the Holy Spirit. But there's one last point that I want to make. And again, this is from the Apostle Paul's life, not from Acts, this time from 1 Corinthians 16. Here's what it says in verses 5 through 9. After I go through Macedonia, I will come to you, for I will be going through Macedonia. And by the way, this is when he made it to Thessalonica. Perhaps I will stay with you a while or even spend the winter so that you can help me on my journey wherever I go. I do not want to see you now and make only a passing visit. I hope to spend some time with you if the Lord permits. But I will stay on at Ephesus until Pentecost because a great door for effective work has opened to me. And there are many who oppose me. Now that may not mean much to you, but I'm going to read that verse again. I will stay on, or the two verses, I will stay on at Ephesus until Pentecost. Because a great door for effective work has opened to me. And there are many who oppose me. Anyone? Anyone? Anyone here? Know where Ephesus is? No? I guess you don't. No one here to answer. Not even the puppets are here. Ephesus was in the province of Asia. Oh, Asia! You mean the place where Paul was not allowed to go on his second missionary journey because the door was closed by the Holy Spirit has now opened up wide. And according to Paul, there is a great door. This isn't just a little porthole door here. This is a great door that's open. In fact, listen to how great the door is. In Acts 19, Paul entered the synagogue. This is in Ephesus. Paul entered the synagogue and spoke boldly there for three months, arguing persuasively about the kingdom of God. Oh, there's that gospel of the kingdom. And he's presenting it, arguing persuasively to the mind, to the heart, and to the will. Some of them became obstinate. They refused to believe and publicly maligned the way. Okay, that door is going to close with the synagogue. So Paul left them. He took the disciples with him and had discussions daily in the lecture hall of Tyrannus. This went on for two years so that all the Jews and Greeks who lived in the province of Asia heard the word of the Lord. <laughs> the door was closed, not allowed to go in, and yet three or four years later, the door is so wide open, the entire province had a chance to hear the gospel of the kingdom. That's God at work. That's being sensitive to the Holy Spirit. Look at the power of the supernatural here. God did extraordinary miracles through Paul so that even handkerchiefs and aprons that had touched him were taken to the sick and their illnesses were cured and the evil spirits left them. Wow! Maybe it wasn't time. Maybe if Paul had gone on that trip into Asia on his second missionary journey and Jimmy the Lock and forced his way into Asia, he may have had a handful of people. But because he followed the prompting of the Holy Spirit, because he said, that door is closed, I'll go where the door is open, and I'll pray doors open, he comes to now Asia on his third missionary journey and spent more time there than any other city in his missionary travels. And this brings us to the final application. A door closed today may open tomorrow. A door closed today may open tomorrow. Don't force the door open. Just keep praying. Be sensitive to the Spirit. Be open, because God has to get the field ready. Since the Holy Spirit, and we saw this, the means, okay, last time, the means, the Holy Spirit, it's the Holy Spirit that illuminates truth to the mind. It's the Holy Spirit that convicts the heart of the sin. It's the Holy Spirit that moves the will to repent and believe. If the Holy Spirit is the one that does all that work, if the Holy Spirit is the one that does it, then obviously we've got to move with the Holy Spirit because the Holy Spirit will be the one getting the fields ready. The Holy Spirit will be the one preparing the harvest. And so when the Holy Spirit says, now, you move. When the Holy Spirit says, it's open, go. 
It requires us to be nimble. It requires us to be sensitive to the Spirit. Not just rely on our programs and our machinery, but be sensitive to the Holy Spirit because He is working behind the scenes to get the next door ready to open. Now, I know what's happening in the Muslim world today. The Islamic Caliphate, which was so horrific, and so many people were beheaded and killed. So many people were raped and tortured because of that. So much history was destroyed. And during the time that was happening, everybody was just grieving and, and, and like, how do we stop this? This is, this is not good. God was preparing a harvest because the caliphate ended up doing more to turn Muslims against Islam than anything we could have done. Because they saw what Islam was like, this militant, radical Islam, and they said, this isn't what I'm looking for. And so they began to become open. The door began to crack open a bit, and the light of the gospel began to come in. Muslims began having dreams about Jesus. He appeared to them in their dreams, claiming to be the way. They started searching out. In Iran, so many Christians, so many Muslims are turning to Christ that the mullahs are freaking out. Why? Because God's opening a door that nobody's going to be allowed to shut. And I believe that God wants to open a door to the gospel in our valley. <clears throat> I believe that God wants to open a door to the gospel in this region. We were missed in the first great awakening. We were missed in the second great awakening. But we will be smack dab in the middle of it in the Schoharie awakening. And therefore, we must be ready when the door opens. We must be ready to move forward, which is why I'm focusing on discipling and getting you ready to serve and minister. Because we're going to need all hands on deck. It's why after the turn of the year, we're going to start that discipleship small group, care group, because we want to make sure we are equipped and ready as disciples to make disciples who themselves will make disciples. The door may not be open yet, but when that door opens, there's going to be a flood of people coming looking for Jesus Christ, looking for what God can do to save souls, to heal bodies, to restore marriages, to break addictions, and we want to be ready. The door is closed now, and you may wonder, will it ever open? Absolutely, because the Holy Spirit is behind it, and the Holy Spirit has been promising our valley for 20 plus years that there is an awakening coming that he wants to bring and transform this, this, this uh, region, and I can't wait to see it. So don't force the door open. Holy Spirit says no. Look for the open door. He's got one. And if you don't see one, pray one open through the Holy Spirit. And be aware that a door closed today may be open tomorrow. We just need to move with the Holy Spirit. All of it is part of a faith worth sharing. Let's pray. Lord, under these unique conditions, conditions that are not a surprise to you, that when this year began, you knew the end from the beginning. You are the sovereign, omniscient, omnipotent God. Discipleship doesn't stop because of COVID-19. The mission of the church doesn't go on hiatus. The message of the gospel is not withdrawn. The method remains the same. The whole gospel to the whole person, the mind, the heart, the will. And the same Holy Spirit that empowered the first century church is the same Holy Spirit that empowers the 21st century church. And today we've learned it's about timing. Lord, this pandemic has changed a lot of things for a lot of people but it has given us, in a way, the gift of time to get ready, to finish the task. That's what you gave us way back in January as a theme for this year, to finish the task. And we want to be found faithful in finishing the task. We want to be disciples who make disciples, who in turn make disciples. We want to be ready that when that door opens, we go rushing through with the good news of Jesus Christ. We can't wait to see all that you're going to do, Lord. And we do pray for open doors. We pray that the enemy's hand that has held this area captive would be loosened and that in Jesus' name the doors would open 
that we might share the good news of Christ. I pray, Lord, for our congregation as they interact with people, that they would be open, looking for doors, looking for doors, opportunities to just be real and to share their faith as we're going to learn how to do more and more through this series. I am just grateful, God, for your grace to us through Jesus Christ, your Son, and for the ever-present help of the Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. So let me see here. I got a couple of people that uh, sent in. Amen. Amen. Had a prayer request here that we pray that justice flows like the ocean tide in our country and the truth will be made known. Absolutely. The Holy Spirit laid on my heart uh, probably about six, six months ago to pray four specific things during the course of this year. One is that truth would be made known and the lies revealed. Two, that people that have lied would be held accountable for their actions, that justice would prevail, that those who uh, were unjustly attacked would be righteously vindicated, and finally that God would bring redemption. So definitely we will pray for this need uh, in just a moment. And then uh, we've asked for, uh, been asked to pray for a person by the name of David. Um, he's in the hospital right now and having some mental health issues. Uh, we want to pray for him. Um, also here, let's see, we got a uh, good question, Alicia. Does God open doors in the spiritual and secular world? Um, uh, that's interesting. I'm not quite sure how to, to take that. In terms of opening doors in the secular world, yes, I do believe God opens doors. Um, I shared last week an example where Charles Finney went into a factory, sewing factory, and God opened the doors. And the uh, factory, they all stopped working and fell on their knees to know Jesus Christ. Um, in terms of the spiritual world, you know, I talked about how God is opening doors in the Muslim world right now. Certainly they, they are religious people, um, but they need Jesus Christ. They need to know that God has come incarnate through Jesus Christ, that he's the word made flesh. Um, so not sure I answered that question, but if you want to follow up with me, I will certainly uh, uh, spend some time with you on that. So let's let's take a look. Uh, let's go to the Lord and take a look. Uh, take these requests to the Lord, shall we? Lord, as we look across our land, um, certainly it is not the United States, but the divided states right now. And there's a lot of question and concern regarding the election and all of it uh, associated with it. Um, Lord, you are a God of truth. You are a God of righteousness, and you are a God of justice. And you're a God of redemption. And so, Lord, we pray for truth, for accountability, for justice, and for redemption. That you would bring to light anything that is underhanded, that the enemy, the dragon, has tried to perpetrate. That you would expose his plans, that the evidence would be overwhelming and indisputable. And that, Lord, you would hold accountable anybody that has sought to... Uh, lie or deceive or cheat or steal because that's the hallmark of the dragon who comes to steal, kill, destroy, but your son came to give life and that more abundantly. We pray that justice roll down like a river, that righteousness like a never-ending stream like the prophet prophesied. And we pray, Lord, that justice would prevail, that where there has been injustice, that it would be righted and that there would be justice and vindication of your servants we pray, Lord, for redemption, that this would be used by your spirit to open doors, not just in our region, but across the nation, for that great awakening that you want to bring that will, will change everything as people are brought into the kingdom. We thank you that you have a righteous reign and that you are wiser than we are, more powerful than we are. And so we entrust ourselves to you and we pray that your kingdom would come and your will would be done in Jesus' name. Amen. So normally I would have you come forward and put your tithes and offerings in, in the plate. Uh, you can't really do that. So on our website, uh, www.cagcoboleskill.org, there is a little yellow oval that says donate. You can go there and go by way of PayPal and donate. Uh, make your contribution to the church, or you can send it in uh, to Calvary Assembly of God, P.O. Box 145, 
Corpus Kill, New York, 12043. Or you can hold on to it when we get back together, Lord willing, next Sunday. Uh, but I'm going to, in faith, at representing the congregation, put my tithes and offerings in. And this is the third Sunday of the month, so it's our mission Sunday. So I'm going to invest in our missionaries who are doing their work around the world. Well, according to my clock, it is 11.01. So we have been together for about an hour. And I'm going to uh, just pray that God blesses you as you move forward in faith to serve him today and in the days ahead. That you would fulfill the mission, bring the message, use the method, apply the means, following his timing. In Jesus' name, go in the grace of our God.